Welcome to the Hardcore MBA Podcast with your host, Erland Bakke. Would you like to have a free copy of the number one international best-selling book, Never Work Again? All you have to do is rate, review, and subscribe to Hardcore MBA Podcast on iTunes and email us a screenshot of your review to erland at mroutsource.com. Hello and welcome to Hardcore MBA. Now, a lot of people wonder how I've been able to travel the world and live the freedom lifestyle. Well, there's two things that have really, really helped me do that. And number one is that I've had a dream team. So I've had a team of people that have run my business for me. The second thing is that I actually have a recurring revenue-based business, which gives me the stability to know that I can project cash flow into the future, I can hire based on growth, etc. Now, Before I managed to free myself from my business, I read a book called Built to Sell. And today on the call, I have John Varillo. He is an entrepreneur that has sold multiple companies. He is a writer for Inc. Magazine, and he has written two best-selling books. One is called Built to Sell. The other one is called The Automatic Customer. And he is the founder of the Value Builder System. On the call here today, we also have... Lisa Campbell, the founder of Yotopia, the premier yoga studio in Covent Garden, London, UK. And what we're going to do here today is we're going to have a live case study where John is going to help Lisa with her business model. John, welcome to the call. Thanks very much. Good to be here. So just to start out, how did you get started in entrepreneurship? You, you, you were born in the UK, you, you went to Canada. Uh, just give us a quick introduction about yourself. Oh, I, I used to work in radio and, and interview different entrepreneurs every day for a show I used to produce. It was nationally syndicated in Canada and uh, uh, sort of aspired or inspired by some of the stories that uh, I was hearing. And I uh, started my own company. It was probably about 20 years ago. And that company was doing what? Uh, I've had a few businesses. Uh, I'd had an event production business, a graphic design studio. Most recently, I had a quantitative market research business. Uh, and uh, now I run the Value Builder System, as you mentioned in your introduction, where we work with entrepreneurs to help them improve the value of their company. Okay, so Built to Sell, is that based on a company, is that like your story, or is that sort of a story made up to sort of better explain to entrepreneurs uh, how they need to build a business? Yeah, no, it's a mashup of a, of a variety of experiences I've had, and also through the interviews that I've done with entrepreneurs. So the story is basically about an entrepreneur who has a, a reasonably successful business company that's, you know, he's able to pull out a couple hundred grand a year in, in profits, but it's lumpy. And it's very hard to kind of predict and project the business. Um, so on the outside, he's successful, but on the inside, uh, he's sort of running around with his, his uh, like a chicken with his head cut off. So it, 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 it lays out a way that you can make your dep- business less dependent on you, uh, starting with this, this notion of, of finding something in your business that meets the, the trifecta of scale, which is that something that's teachable to employees, valuable to customers, and repeatable, so TVR. And so, yeah, no, it's, it's not me, but it's, a, it's an amalgam of some of the experiences that both I've had and also listened to in terms of doing the interviews. So it lays out this formula for pulling yourself out of, uh, out of the day-to-day operations of your business. One of the things that I talk to uh, people about, my clients, is, um, you know, Stephen Covey said, you need to start with the end in mind. Um, and at some point, when you start a business, uh, you will have to, uh, you know, uh, move away from it. Either you sell it, or you, uh, you know, or you maybe don't exist anymore. So a lot of entrepreneurs they don't start with this idea of selling their business or or realizing that that's something at some point that if they spend all their years building up a business and uh, it's all built around the entrepreneur, then they can't pass it on to their kids or or anybody else. Uh, why do you think that happens? You know, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are running successful companies and they don't necessarily see the upside in selling. So let's say somebody is offering them three times EBITDA to, to sell their business and, and they're saying, well, why on earth would I sell for three times profit when three years from now I can have all that money and still own my business? 
And that's a very common, I think, uh, way to think. A couple of things that, that I think makes, uh, sort of breaks down that argument. Number one, you can do much better than three times pre-tax profit for your business. We've had business owners, we've worked through the value builder system that have increased the, the, you know, their, their value closer to six or seven times pre-tax profit, number one. Number two, you never know when you're going to ride your business over the top. I mean, nobody looks back on their business and says, um, you know, oh, I, you know, I, I, I'm sad that I, I sold what I did. It's very rare. Most people look back and say, "Thank God I sold." When I, you know, when I interviewed Tim Ferriss for uh, an article I was, I was, uh, I was doing, I said, "You know, you worked four, you know, four hours a, a week. How on earth? Why on earth did you want to sell your company, um, Brain Quicken, which is which is what the four hour work week was based on?" And he said, "You know, my brain." was like a computer running virus protection software. Although, you know, so many CPUs were being taken up with my thinking about the business, although I only had to work four hours a week in the business, I was actually just churning constantly in the background thinking about the company. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, constantly are thinking about their business and that takes away resources that they would otherwise uh, have to put towards the next idea or towards friends, family, vacation, travel, whatever. So, you know, I think there's a lot of upside benefits to selling um, and, and a lot of downside risk to not selling. You know, you could ride your business over the top. We've had lots of examples of companies where, you know, they had $200,000 in profit, $400,000 profit, and they just assumed they were going to have $800,000 in profit the next year, but then they actually go and, and shrink, and then nobody wants the business, uh, and nobody's going to buy a shrinking business for a premium multiple. So... Anyways, there's lots of reasons that I think you know folks should think about at the end in mind. So, what kind of size companies? Um, so, if somebody's listening to this and they have a company and they want to work with you, how, how does how does that work? As what, what kind of size do they have to be? And also a little bit about uh, the process that you take them through. Yeah, well, they're going to start off by completing their value builder score. Um, so, you get your value builder score by completing a questionnaire. It takes about 15 minutes to complete. There's about 30 questions. And we give you a score. The average score of a business starting with us is 59 out of a possible 100. For those that graduate with a score of 80 or more, uh, they will go on statistically to sell at a 71% premium. So we, uh, I don't personally work with business owners, but we have about 500 advisors around the world who do. And they will work you through this, this methodology we've developed with 12 unique steps to help them you know, improve their, their value builder score and ultimately the value of their company. So you've, you've developed a framework uh, and a training for other people to help other people sell their business. Am I right? The 500 people, they have like a license or a training? That's right. So there, there are certified value builders, which is a designation we provide, and then they have access to our platform. They can offer our, uh, um, you know, our, our approach and methodology to their client. Okay. So if, so if I was looking for somebody, say, in the UK, I'd be able to find that on, on builttosell.com? Or? No, no. You'd complete your value builder score. We don't publish our list of advisors for a variety of reasons. But, uh, so the first step is go to uh, valuebuilder.com or valuebuildersystem.com. Uh, either of those two sites will get to the right place. Uh, you enter your email address and we'll send you the invitation to complete the questionnaire. And then uh, once the questionnaire is completed, we will uh, connect you directly with a uh, business owner. And we have lots of advisors in the UK. Uh, we're basically in, if you will, Commonwealth countries. So Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, UK, Ireland, most of Western Europe, uh, Canada, United States. That's kind of where we have advisors. And uh, let's say we're on the other side of the table and we were like, oh, I want to start an accounting company. Um, what kind of things should I be thinking about uh, when actually buying a business? From the standpoint of buying a business, mm. it's, it's virtually identical to the things you would want to work on when you're looking to sell your company. So there are these eight factors that acquirers look for when they are, are evaluating a company to buy. Um, so they are things like how much recurring revenue does the company have? How dependent is the company on its owner? How dependent is the company on a single customer, employee, or supplier? The, I won't go through them all, but there's a variety of different factors. And so from a, uh, from a, if, you're, if you're looking to sell your business, it's really identifying how you're performing on these eight factors and then improving your score. Likewise, if you're looking to buy a business, you're doing the inverse. You're looking for companies 
um, that that have uh, you know lots of customer diversification, where the owner is not the central kind of body inside the company, et cetera, uh, where there is lots of recurring revenue. And if you don't see these these factors, just like when you're buying a car and you see a dent in the side or buying a house and the roof needs you know replacing, you're going to negotiate down the price because of these factors. And what about going to uh, business brokers? Do you go to uh, websites that list companies for sale or do you go to a business broker? Um, do you go, go directly to a company? How does, what, what, what recommended route do you? Yeah, so when you're actually gonna, gonna take your business to market and sell it, um, I, I highly recommend you use what they call an intermediary. And it depends on the size of the business. If the, if the value of your company, if you estimate it to be at least $5 million or more, you're going to go to an M&A professional, a mergers and acquisitions professional. They're going to charge you anywhere from roughly 4 to 5% of the sale of your business. So if you sell it for $10 million, bucks, you're going to write them a check for $400,000. But they're going to create some enormous... Uh, leverage because they create competitive pressure for your business. They can they try to get two or three people bidding over your company. So that's an M and A professional. If you're below five million in uh, in value, if you will, um, you're likely best served to to work with a business broker. A business broker uh, works in much the same way. They will charge you what they call a success fee, which is on the sale of the business, and. Um, and, and again, they're, they're going to try to stimulate uh, kind of demand. Business brokers often list companies on listing websites, even their own website, for example. Um, and they'll do that either anonymously, if you prefer, or, you know, uh, or reveal the company if you want them to. And uh, their business model is slightly different. They are relying on some inbound traffic for, from you know, SEO and, and search and, and so forth. But again, it, it sort of depends on the size of your company, who you'd work with. Mm-hmm. And what about the time scale? So let's say I say, oh, I want to sell a business. Uh, how much time should I typically um, allow for that to happen? It's not something you go from one day to the next and suddenly you've sold a business. It takes, takes a while. It's one of the biggest misconceptions about selling. Um, and, and that is that, that you can sort of flip a switch and sell. I, I think you're, you're really looking at a five-year period to execute a transaction. Let me break that down for you. So uh, to begin with, when you sell a company in the small business space, um, it is very unlikely that you would not have some sort of earnout or transition period where you've got to work in your company as an employee of the acquirer. So, for example, if you sold your business today, uh, you would likely have to stay in and a lot of your money would be so-called at risk in order for you to achieve certain goals in the future. So, if you want to be on the beach in five years, uh, you know you have to actually sell your business three years from now. Uh, The actual execution of the sale, so once you hire the M&A banker or the business broker or they take your business to market and then you negotiate, and that takes between 6 and 12 months. So now you've got another year. So you've got the two-year earnout, the one year to transact, and I think you realistically have two years to get your business ready to sell. Unless you want to sell it at a fire sale, um, you really have to spend a couple of years preparing it to sell. Um, that's really working on the eight drivers, the eight factors that drive the value of your company. It's, there are a variety of different things you're going to do. So I think you know, you're looking at a five-year window. And again, the, the biggest mistake I see entrepreneurs make is they say, okay, I want to be on the beach by the time I'm 50. And so they, look, they turn around at 49 and start thinking, okay, I've got to sell this company. Well, if they're lucky, by the time they're 55, they're going to actually exit their business. So I say pull your pull your you know beach date you know forward by five years, and that's really when you should start. Fantastic. So uh, yeah, so allow some time and and think long term. Um, do some planning. What about talking to uh, employees? To what extent should you involve employees in that kind of process? Should you um, keep them in the dark, or should you involve them, or how does that work? You know, I would divide your employees up into two buckets. I'd have your uh, kind of rank and file employees and then a very small group of, of kind of senior key employees. 
And the latter group are the ones I, th I think you probably need to, to, to let in on the secret, but only do that once you've thought through an incentive plan for them that compensates them based on the sale of the company. So the, the only people you should, you should share the information with are people that have a vested interest in the success of the sale. So th that might mean stock options, but more likely it could just be a a blunt instrument like a stay bonus. So you, you could say to you know a key employee, look, we're going to sell this company. Um, if you stay through the sale and we're successful, you're going to get one check the day the you know the sale goes forward, and then another check a year later if you're still with the company. And so it's basically a bribe, but it's 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 asking those employees to both keep the information confidential, but also to to stay and participate in the sale because. You know, when you sell your company, you need to merchandise a management team. You need to be able to say to a buyer, look, it's not just me. There are other people here who are going to help shepherd this business, help you maximize its value long term. And so you want to be able to show two or three kind of key employees. The rest of the employees, uh, I think you really want to, to ensure they do not find out because it's not fair to the employees. They, you know, they will spend many, many hours working themselves up into a frenzy about what it means to them to sell their business. And frankly, you don't know what it means for, to them until you actually are acquired and you know what the choir, you know, the, even the, the acquirer may, may tell you one thing but have a very different intention with your employees anyway. So you just, you just don't know. About two-thirds of the deals that get a term sheet never go on to consummate in a, in a transaction. So you, if you're out there telling your employees every time you get a term sheet, well, they're just going to be whipped into a frenzy. They're never going to do their work. They're going to be looking for a job. They're going to, I mean, it's going to be a disaster. So don't tell your employees, I think, unless there's one or two very senior key employees who have a vested interest in the success of the sale. And the uh, term sheet means? Basically a written offer to buy your business. Cool, cool. Okay, so guys, if you want to learn more about this, check out Built to Sell. Um, on Amazon, you know, it's a great book. I really recommend it. Um, I do have a question just to segue over to uh, the automatic customer. Um, you write for Inc. Magazine. Um, what kind of a strategic uh, benefit do you get from from being a um, a writer for Inc. Magazine? A couple things. I mean, Inc. does send quite a bit of traffic over to ValueBuildersystem dot com, and and probably arguably the better is the search juice that that we get from having a library of articles there. So the natural search engine, the, the, um, the SEO rankings uh, help because Inc. is a, a massive site, uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of unique visitors every month. Therefore, when, and on, on every one of our articles, it, it, it uh, links to Value Builder System. So it just creates a, a, a nice natural search uh, sort of uh, engine, if you will, in the background. Okay, so it's... Uh... So it's traffic, and it's also, what about the networking aspect of it? Do you get to hang out with all the other uh, writers, and is there like a whole network around it? Not really. No, no. I mean, if you want to go to the Inc. events, then then you can meet some other writers. But no, it's not really a networking um, venue. That's, that's not really what, what it's about, or, or, or certainly the way I've used it. I'm sure others do, but that's just not the way I do it. And I guess because you come from the world of interviewing entrepreneurs, I mean, writing about business comes very natural to you and is something you enjoy. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a lot of faults. Uh, I, I, I shudder at technology. I get completely overwhelmed by complexity. I get short-tempered. I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of faults. Mm. If I have maybe one... Uh, one strength, it's, it's distilling a fairly complex idea into something that, that I can sort of, I personally can comprehend and then maybe, maybe I can share that with others so that I can find an analogy or find a way of saying something very complicated in a, in a fairly simple way. So, you know, I've got lots of faults, but maybe that's one, one area that, I, that I've got uh, uh, some strengths around, which may perhaps is why... I like to speak. I like to write. You know, the, the, the distillation of a kind of complex idea into into two or three kind of salient points is mm. is maybe how I like to spend my time. So, mm. fantastic. So um, you wrote this book, Built to Sell, and now Automatic Customer, uh, which I devoured in um, I think a day. Um, 
because I really, really like subscription-based businesses. Um, why did you write the book, and what do you like about the automatic customer? Well, you know, Built to Sell was about the value of your company, and, and then Value Builder System, the, the business I started after that, we look at these eight key drivers, and the one area that a lot of businesses fell down on uh, was recurring revenue, and it's one of the big drivers of your business. The reason that recurring revenue is important is because acquirers want to know, you know, how this business is going to perform once you, the owner, leave. And when, when I say recurring revenue or subscription or annuity streams, a lot of entrepreneurs think software companies. And they think, well, yeah, that's how I buy Microsoft Office. That's how I buy Salesforce.com or Infusionsoft or whatever software I use in my company. But, um, you know, I, I run a yoga studio like Lisa or mm -hmm. I'm in a manufacturing business or I have a retail store. I can't create recurring revenue. And, and that's what I really tried to focus in on in writing this book is that no matter what kind of business you're in, um, you know, again, manufacture, distribution, services, retail, in fact, there are these nine subscription models that you can review and then adopt at least one of them, I believe, in virtually any business. So, uh, and I think, again, that's what's going to help drive the, the value of your company. Okay, cool. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa now. Uh, Lisa, when did you start Utopia, and uh, how many how, much, how many recurring uh, members do you have a month? So I opened the studio in late two thousand and eleven. So it's been going um, well almost to the day twelve four years. Um, the recurring revenue I have about. About thirty percent of my revenue now is is it comes from recurring revenue. Although I would qualify that by saying that we we have a combination of of of, of sort of pricing options from a single class to a class pass to the membership that we do offer, which is which is fairly flexible. Um, it's a month to month membership. We call it. Um, I would sort of deem it recurring of of some ilk um, in in the sense that. People can sign up, and um, and and money is taken um, from their account on a on a recurring basis. But they have the flexibility to terminate at any time, <clears throat> so it's not a minimum term membership. Hmm. And one of the things that we've talked about, Lisa, is um, because you have a great deal. So basically, you get uh, twenty days of yoga for thirty five pounds. And then the challenge there is is how do you convert those into full time membership uh, customers? So. Uh, John, any any ideas on, on how to convert somebody that's already put in their data, they're already purchased, uh, but after the 20 days, they're looking at like a £100 membership. How do you best convert them into repeat customers? Yeah, I think I, I need to understand a little bit more, Lisa. So uh, you're trying to take people who have bought a class pass and then convert them into becoming a member. Is that right? <laughs> Well, so so the draw in the first instance is the introductory offer, as Erland mentioned. Um, that's available only on the first visit, and and ninety seven percent of the clients will take that up. Um, it's 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 very cost effective. Um, so it's twenty consecutive days of yoga, and they can come as many or as as, as infrequently as they want in that in that initial period. Um, so the conversion point could potentially be at the end of that introductory offer. And, and yes, you know, obviously there are upselling opportunities from a class pass if people have chosen to take a class pass instead of the membership option. So 97% of your customers come in on the 20 days of yoga for £35. And then what, just tell me what happens after that. So what proportion by membership, what proportion by class pass, what proportion do nothing um, so between 10 and 20% would buy a membership after that period. And it would typically be sold on the basis of the frequency of their visits during the introductory period. Mm -hmm. So if they're coming more often, obviously it's more cost effective for them to transfer onto the membership. Got it. And then what about the, uh, the other 80 to 90%? Well, um, there, there are many people in London um, and, and it's po possibly the case else, elsewhere as well, um, that take up the introductory offer with, frankly, no, no desire to do anything after that. So the, 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 
the the take up rate on on a class pass or or, or a membership isn't substantive to some extent because the value of the introductory offer is is so good um you know that there is a there's a there's a natural fall off and i think that's so of all yoga studios so what's your question lisa it sounds like you, you it sounds like you're you're fine you've got this 10 to 20 percent conversion rate and you've got this great offer so what's your question well, I think Erlen's question was how to improve on 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 the number of people that um, that, that take up the the month to month. Mm-hmm. Well, what's the what is the the month to month? What's the offer? What's the month to month offer? So it's a hundred pounds a month, um, and you can come as often as you like in that period. And there are, um, I think, as as compared to a gym membership, you know, I think the psychology is slightly different. Um, in in my sort of in my thinking, um, people sort of typically in January will take up a gym membership, almost whether they sort of intend to carry it out on or not. In their mind, perhaps they do. I think the thinking on a on a sort of a more boutique offering um, is more considered. Um, it's not it's not necessarily cheap. They have to be committed to yoga and perhaps not to any other sport because that's all that we offer. Um, and and so it's it, it's a more considered process, I believe, um, and and one has to be committed, um, perhaps in the long run, to to practicing yoga. Um, obviously, you know, I'm 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 very keen on your sort of recurring revenue model, and that was my ambition um, was to you know increase as high as possible that that percentage of my revenue that is recurring. And the extent to which I can do something that I'm not currently doing um, would be would be helpful. I think. Um, what are some of the other sort of? So I would argue that pricing, just pricing it based on you know 100 pounds a month, all you can eat is is somewhat of a crude or or unimaginative. Uh, subscription model in the sense that it's basically saying, you know, buy a subscription and you can have lots of yoga cheaper. (laughs) Like the value proposition is just kind of cheap. So, you know, what I would be doing in your shoes is thinking about what are some of the other um, uh, maybe less tangible, maybe more creative, more romantic, more uh, interesting ways you could bolster the value proposition of membership. So, you know, you know your your hundred pound a month customers. You know the ones who are keen yoga uh, yogis, whatever. What could you do to to bolster the value of membership? Yeah, that's interesting. I've, I've thought of that. I mean, one one of the one of the things that is slightly different, not so many yoga studios offer this very flexible membership, and I, it's been helpful for me, and it has increased um, the, the, the take-up rate um, of this sort of, you know, ease of termination. So, so a lot of other studios have a minimum 12-month term um, on this membership option, and, and, and offering sort of creative ways to sort of, as you say, bolster um, the value of that um, is... Is is easier in the sense that you know you're going to get a minimum twelve month kind of return on 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 that investment, as it were. Um, w- would you say that with this more flexible membership option, the month to month, where you know <clears throat> at the extreme somebody might sign up for a month and then terminate, um, that 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 kind of creative process would change, the value proposition would change, or would you say you know you would be offering something? After they'd 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 sort of been a member for six months. Yeah, I I think I think the only thing your offer is going to do is make huge yoga aficionados uh, make their yoga practice less expensive because you're taking the people who already love yoga, who already are going to come to yoga a lot anyways, and you're just making it cheaper for them to do that. And I'd argue that you're probably cannibalizing your revenue by even having a membership model uh, because you'd probably be better off just having a you know, class class or a single class offering um, because, again, That's right. all you're doing is cannibalizing your revenue. So I think I want you to think more creatively about 
what it means to have a membership. So yes, of course, you can come all you want to the yoga studio. But what other, what other things could you, could you add into that subscription to make it more romantic? I mean, let me give you an example. Could you do special evenings where you bring in uh, you know, experts on breathing or experts on nutrition and only make that evening available to your members? Can you take your most advanced, you know, the, the classes that are always full, I don't know, what, what time of day are your classes always most popular? The evenings, lunchtime, mornings, what are the most popular? Evening, six o'clock. So the six o'clock class is only for members. So the only way you can get into the six o'clock class is if you're a member. And here's the value proposition about being a member. You get the first dibs on your, on the six o'clock time slot, which is always our most popular. Who are your most, uh, who are your most popular yoga teachers? Lisa. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I can, they're, they're, I typically put them in the six o'clock slots. Sure. But what, so give me the name of one of your, doesn't matter. You don't have to say the name. Let's say, let's say Jane is your most popular, uh, uh, yoga student. So every member comes with a, every membership comes with a one-on-one -on -one, 30 minute flexibility breathing session with Jane our number one yoga enthusiast. I, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business, Lisa. I'm trying to get you to think more creatively about what it means to be a member. Yeah, no, you... that's that's really helpful. I mean, I just guess going back to my previous question, you know, the, the, the struggle that I have with this is, as I say, you know, if someone can sign up just for a month and then terminate at the end of the month, if I'm giving away um, ostensibly for, for free some sort of added value for that membership, um, yes, it's a value for, for me if they've stayed for 12 months, but it's not a value for me if they stay for a month. And, and some of those ideas that you suggest will work either way. So the events would um, that are offered to all of the members. But if you're looking at sort of targeting a sole member and offering them on one to one, when would you recommend, given this flexible membership that I have? Can you can you see what I'm, I'm getting at? You know, you yeah. don't want to offer that on day one. Well, in fact, I, I'd argue you do. What, what, what we found in doing the research for the automatic customer is that the first 30 days of their membership is, it, it predicts their likelihood to stay uh, beyond any other measure. So how you get a new subscriber going with their membership is going to define their attrition rate going forward. So the natural inclination is, is it, given your model. And by the way, Lisa, virtually all business-to-consumer subscription models are exactly the same way in the sense that people can cancel any time. Mm. So you're not alone in, in, in that model. I think you see... Uh, you know, lock-in dates, contract lengths. You see that more in the business-to-business -business context. But in the business-to-consumer context, almost all subscription models are, like whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or Netflix, I mean, you just cancel when you want to stop. So you're not alone in that. And so what those companies have learned is that as counterintuitive as it feels or sounds, what you want to do is pack enormous value into the first 30 days of their membership. So if you're going to do the one-on-one -on -one with the best teacher, you do it in the first 30 days. If you want to have them come to a course, you do it in the first 30 days. If you want to have them come to their, you know, the, the prime spot on 6 o'clock on a Tuesday night, you want to do it in the first, Thursday, uh, first uh, 30 days because that is what's going to predict their likelihood to attract. The m most ne like new or novice subscription company operators would, would parse the value out evenly throughout the 12 months for fear like you have of that they're going to they're going to churn. And so they'll say, you know, 30 day mark you get the the one on one with Jane and at the 90 day mark you get an invitation to our special, you know, evening with, you know, such and such. Um, that's actually wrong. I think you want to pack way more value in your first 30 days. And then by some extent you can you can basically put the relationship on to some extent on autopilot beyond that. I mean, I think you want to trickle in value throughout the year, but you don't need to put anywhere near as much emphasis as you do in that first 30 days. Very interesting. Arguably, you know, your intro offer has been successful in getting people in, um, but but I'm not sure that it's the best introductory offer because I worry that having such a, 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 a compelling introductory offer, 20 days of yoga for 35 quid, like I get why that's compelling. I also get why 80 to 90% of your customers don't buy the membership afterwards. It may be too compelling. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and 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 actually, I mean, it it is reflective of um, you know a, a lot of thought that I've had in this in in this area, sort of more more generically, the, the, the sort of the pricing mechanism. And and frankly, I have been fearful to do anything other than what other yoga studios do in London in the round. Hmm. And and so you know and and so it kind of it it kind of reflects where the competition is in in London for yoga and i've been very nervous to move away from that dramatically i think i think one of the one of the one of the challenges um is also that you you offer a lot of different types of membership a lot of different sort of pay as you go um uh, John, in terms of offering types of membership, how many different types of membership should a yoga studio be offering? Should there be like a premium membership and then like a membership and then there should maybe be like a pay and you go uh, package um, so you, so the, the customers have three different types of uh, choices. Uh, mm. What's your view on that? Um, so I'm a, I'm a big believer in giving customers an ultimatum, meaning we work on a membership model you're in or you're out. And I think having, you know, a membership model on the side as well as the pay as you go, as well as the class pass, I, I you know, I worry about the, 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 the long-term success of the membership uh, because given the choice, virtually all customers are going to want, are going to want to opt for the flexibility of a, of a, of a single class pass or, or a group of class passes at a discount. Um, so I'd like to see you to go all in, Lisa, on the membership model where you say, look, we, we have a unique studio. We have a very unique vibe. We don't accept everybody that comes in. We, we really look for a very specific type of yogi who comes in, who, who believes in what we're doing. And so we have this membership. And basically what that means is that you get access to these nine things um, and, and really that's our model. We, we don't offer one-off classes. You can go down the street to the other yoga studios. If you want to do one-off classes, we have something very unique here and, and we, you know, we don't, we're not desperate for your business. Um, but those who, who, who really like and, and are inspired to the, the sort of creativity, of what we ought to offer, you know, love it again, at least I don't know your business. I, we've met now for 20 minutes, but I, I think, uh, you know, if you go all in on membership, I think that's when you start to see some of the the the, the real economic benefits of uh, of having a subscription model. Mm. I I love that in theory. Can you give me any advice as a business owner that has, you know, my sort of well, I mean, a lot at risk, you know, for for, for getting something like that wrong, such a bold step. Um, the potential for getting it wrong and that people don't buy into that. Um, how do I get myself over that sort of mental hurdle? <laughs> couple things. Uh, one, charge up front. So, you know, you can certainly say to your clientele, look, it's, it's 100 pounds a month. Uh, and, but really what we'd ask you to do and what we, what we typically do with most of our, our companies is we do 999 as a one-time charge once a year. And so you sign up for the membership, it's, it's 995 pounds, uh, and that, it, that gets you covered for uh, a year. So basically you're charging for your membership up front, giving you the cash flow to, to basically cash flow the change. That's number one. Uh, number two, don't start with your best customers. You know, if you're experimenting with a model, uh, you're trying to fine tune, sort of uh, sand off the edges of a model. Uh, talk to your C customers, the the customers that rarely come in, the customers that came in once and and haven't come back. Go back to them and say, "Hey, we're thinking of building this membership. Um, here's what we'd like to offer you. Your conversion rate is going to be much higher with your A customers and B customers. But if you can get your C's to convert, that's going to give you enormous confidence to go to the A's and B's and say, hey, you know, we, we changed our model. The worst thing you can do is go to the A's with a month-to-month -month offer. Because uh, the A's will go, but none of the B's or C's, you know, like you don't know that the B's or C's will go. And, yeah. and in my chance, you know, your chances of being able to run the whole business on just converting the A's is, is low. So... Uh, go to your C's first and, and make sure the offers is, you, you can express it as a monthly cost, 
Um, but but say that you know we do we do charge the full year uh, at the point you subscribe. Hmm. So when you're advertising, it says it says whatever ninety five pounds a month, uh, and then in in small letters it says paid annually. Yeah. Um, sense of how compared with other offers on a monthly basis, but you're getting all your money up front. Hmm. And and uh, would would Lisa still keep the uh, the sort of uh, twenty days thirty five pound offer to sort of get people to uh, get people in, and then maybe have like a one on one consultation, talk about what are you trying to get out of your yoga practice, where are you in life, um, why yoga is important, you know how it how it positively will will affect um, their body. Um, is that how can we? Because I'm all, uh, part of this is is getting the the the, the people in. And then converting them, right? So, how, so mm. how how does that fit in terms of the the sort of uh, charge per year model? Yeah, I think I think you know um, you want to be careful as to not give people too much. You know, uh, years ago, we're, I'm going back decades and decades now. My father was in magazines and newspaper publishing, and and I can remember having a conversation with him around the dinner table and we were talking about different direct mail packages that he that they, the company had sort of put out of the marketplace trying to convert customers to to become subscribers to these magazines and newspapers. And uh, I remember looking at them and saying, well, Dad, why don't you just send the frigging magazine? If you think it's so great, why don't you send the whole magazine and say, do you want to subscribe? And he said, yeah, we tried. That doesn't work. Mm. And the reason it doesn't work is that you can't possibly describe all of the benefits of being a, mag- a subscriber to a magazine throughout the lifetime of a magazine subscription um, with one magazine. Sometimes you're going to get a theme that you don't really, you know, doesn't resonate. Sometimes a, a writer or a columnist, their article it kind of falls flat on you. And so generally speaking, trying to articulate an entire year's worth of benefit in one sent by sending one magazine fails. So they would always get a much better conversion rate by explaining what was in the membership as opposed to showing what was in the membership. And I've re- always remembered, I mean, we're going back 30 years to give you a sense of how long this is, but I've always remembered that now when we, when we talk about subscriptions because being able to describe what it's like to being a member may actually be a much more compelling conversion rate than simply giving them 20 passes for 35 pounds. So, you know, I think you, I'd want to experiment with a few things, Lisa. I mean, I think people get what yoga is. So, um, you know, I'm not sure you need to give them a bunch of free passes to come to your yoga studio to explain what it is. Maybe you have an information night once a week where members are encouraged to, you know, bring a friend or, uh, you know, there's a speaker that comes in once a month and you invite some, some people that are in your prospect pool. You know, I, maybe it's, it's one free session or, or, you know, five sessions for five quid. But my inclination is, is 20 days of yoga for 35 pounds is just too much. You might sate the audience. Like at the end, they might be like, okay, I've got my fill. I don't, you know, I, I've done lots of yoga. I, I, I'm feeling very relaxed and very well stretched. I, I don't need to buy the membership. Mm. So, John, my last question here is: So, um, let's say Lisa would like to to work with you and your team on on creating, you know, the automatic customer business. Uh, what could uh, what could we do? What could she do? Well, I think you go to valuebuildersystem.com and drop your email address into into that uh, on there's a big box so you can drop your email box into and we'll get you the score. We would work with Lisa to to take her through her questionnaire, identify her score on the eight drivers including recurring revenue um, and and uh, and work with her to improve it over time. Fantastic. So valuebuilder.com yeah, valuebuildersystem.com. Valuebuildersystem.com. So, guys, you heard it here. Uh, John Varillo talking about the automatic customer built to sell, amazing books. Check them out. And uh, you also write for Inc. So, there's also juicy articles there as well. John and Lisa, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, guys. Good thank luck, you. Lisa. Thank you. So, guys, if you enjoyed this episode of Hardcore MBA, please, please, please. Go to iTunes, leave us a review. It really helps us reach more people and keep the show amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Bye-bye. 
This podcast is brought to you by MrOutsource.com. Outsourcing to the Philippines done for you. Mr. Outsource is a recruitment company matching busy entrepreneurs with Filipino virtual assistants so you can have the time to focus on what's important. 